United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Oh, no roll call. All right. Mr. McCardle, I'll turn it over to you. All righty. Uh, we'll start the work session out. We're going to, instead of doing the utility rates first, we're going to go to the secondary water source. And Stephanie's got a little presentation I guess she wants to do first, so uh, I'll turn it over to her. Yep, just a real quick overview first. Um, this is just a, a report back from our previous work sessions, um, just as a point of history. And if people wonder why we've been looking at these items, back in November of 2014, at that time, Council asked for a review of the sewer, sewer and water rate changes and said that you'd like to have a more consistent implementation so that we could afford to do future projects. Also in January 2015, um, one of the council goals was that they wanted to look at what we were anticipating for future infrastructure needs and planning to include either the closure of the water treatment plant or what else we needed to do to get to that secondary source or, or additional supply for Mitchell. Um, that was addressed to, in three different budget items or three different goal setting items in 2015. So you discussed it again at the April 15th work session as well. So just so the general public knows, this is something that council's been working on for a number of years and we're to, to a point where we're ready to make some presentations to council. So first one, like um, Councilor McArdle said, we'll start with the secondary water source and then you'll have a presentation on the utility rate review. <coughs> Council, how are we doing tonight? You, you need to turn it on, though. I turned the little clicker off. Okay. On the side. There you go. Got it. All right. So, like Stephanie said, I'm going to start off with the uh, findings of our secondary water source, um, where we're at with that, and at the end, we'll have some uh, recommendation to Council. Um, along with some costs. All right. So like I said, uh, we'll talk about our current water use, our future water use, um, alternatives to get us to our future water use, and then we'll have um, a summary at the end. Um, currently, um, we receive our water from um, Bonhomme Yankton BY uh, Water District. Our minimum contract amount is 500,000 gallons per day. Our guaranteed amount is 2.65 million gallons per day. Um, we, we do uh, receive water in excess of 2.65. Um, there is an um, additional um, rate structure for that additional water, um, but it is at the total discretion of BY. After 2.65, um, by contract, um, BY could tell us um, that we can't receive any more water. They've never done that. Um, but there, there, it is that way in the contract. Um, and just for your reference, we do exceed um, 2.65 MGD, 25% of the year. I, I'll, I'll show that data. Yep. So, next coming up, this shows our uh, water usage by day um, from 14 to 19. Um, as well as um, 19 to 23. Um, those three lines that you see, um, that indicates our, our rate structure after 2.65. The orange line is 2.65. Um, the uh, red, orange or red line, red line is um, 2.9, and the top line is 3.15. And the way our current rate with BY is $1.23. Um, it increases um, $1.90 once you go to 2.9, $2.40 to 2.9, an additional $2.90 um, on top of the $1.23 um, after 
So this just kind of gives you a general idea of where we're at with our summer and our winter usage. Um, it is quite a bit different. Um, our average day um, during the summer, you know, is a two to three million gallons a day with our max being, you know, high threes to low four million gallons per day. Winter usage, you're around the, you know, the one million gallons per day up to one and a half. Um, our average over the whole year is roughly 2 million gallons per day is where we're currently at. Our highest ever recorded rate that we, that we showed um, from about 2012 on was 4.41 on July 6th of 2017. Future water use, um, infrastructure design group and AE2S completed a um, alternate water source um, study for us. Um, they projected our, 24, our 2040 water use, our average day demand to be 2.14 MGD, and our maximum day demand 5.4 MGD. That's projected out to 2040, um, and they determined that by um, looking at historical data as far as water use and projections for um, our population. The first alternative that was considered um, was updating what we have with BY. Um, that would bring our capacity up to the 5.4 MGD. Um, improvements would include roughly 13 and a half miles of transmission line um, between the plant and trip, along with some pump station upgrades. Um, this would, it, obviously then we would stay with a, a single source. I'm just going to, I'm going to go through these high level and if you have any detailed questions, go ahead and ask. Um, alternative two that we looked at was Lake Mitchell, um, our wastewater or our water treatment plant improvements, excuse me. That would be two and a half million gallons of additional water capacity to get us to the 5.4. Um, we'd have improvements to the plant, uh, which would bring the water quality taste up to what BY is. Um, in order to do that, we would need to waste roughly 44% of our treated water. So in order to make two and a half million gallons a day, we'd have to make four and a half. So we're wasting roughly two million gallons a day to get us to two and a half. Um, but this does provide a secondary source. And it would waste 44% of the treated water because why? Because the process, it's called RO. Um, it's a, right. It's a... It's the byproduct of how you how you treat that water. And, w and when we do talk about Lake Mitchell, you know, I know you probably have more history than I do, but looking through the old reports, um, you can tell there's a history of, you know, being worried about the lake levels being too low, the potential of running out of water. You know, at one point we did pump um, James River water back up into the lake, um, and obviously why we looked at going to BY World Water in 2003. So I'd like to just quick hit on that. You're probably not old enough to remember the taste. I am actually. I remember Fountain Pop and Mitchell when we come and eat with the family was a little different. But, um, it left a good smart on you. You had to be disobedient. Yep. That's why he's the way he is. Why we're all the way we are. So alternative three is Rainel Community Water District. Um, that would provide a minimum of 2.5 MGD. There would be the possibility for more. Um, we'd be looking at 38 miles of transmission line from their, plat, their plant near Platt um, to Stickney, and then 31 miles of transmission line from Stickney uh, to Mitchell. The red and the blue lines just signify a different route. If possible, more than likely it would be the blue, the blue line. And this does provide a secondary source. Alternative four, um, an intake at the Missouri River. City of Mitchell does have water rights near Chamberlain. Um, it, this alternative looks at a raw water intake with a pump station. So basically essentially pumping water to the waste, our water treatment plant to be treated. Um, that'd be 75 miles of transmission line. There would need to be a one million gallon um, ground storage tank on, at the highest point, which would basically just be outside of Chamberlain. The, the graphic you have there is the elevation from Chamberlain to Mitchell, with Chamberlain on the left and Mitchell on the right. So you can see there is quite a bit of um, drop from 
once you get past the bluffs of Chamberlain uh, to Mitchell. And this does provide a secondary source. So I'm sure the big question everyone is wondering is how much these are going to cost. So the BY water upgrades are roughly 40 million. Lake Mitchell improvements would be 43 and a half million. Um, Randall Community Water District would be 60 million. The Missouri River intake and treating it in Mitchell is 93 million. Um, if we did build a treatment plant just outside of Chamberlain and then send it to Mitchell, that'd be roughly 150 million. Um, Randall Rural Water is in the infancy stages of completing um, a regional water plan. Um, we have had conversations with Randall Community Water District. Um, as you know, noticed earlier in the year, um, we looked at pers um, looking into um, possibly getting water from them. Um, so with that, we are recommending um, proceeding with Randall Rural Water at the $60 million um, to get that secondary source and that, that good water quality. Why wouldn't we just increase with BY or why, you know? Yep. I mean, you kind of talked about Lake Mitchell, but what about BY? I mean, so, that's not a you know what it is. Yep. The reasoning being um, BY gives us our single source. If for some reason something happens at their plant, um, we have a water line break in between, um, you know, we would have a backup and vice versa. Um, you know, if regardless of, of how we're moving forward, the city still needs additional water. Um, so if Randall is not selected, uh, we would move forward with the BY improvements and really being $20 million away for a secondary source, I believe anyone thinking, you know, 20, 40, 60 years from now um, would say that we did not make a bad decision going with a second source. Um, for the city. Um, with how BY is set up, we would be looking at, you know, the 5.4 MGD, whereas with Randall, we would have the possibility to um, increase um, that amount as well as the additional water that we do receive from BY above our 2.65 contract currently. So, I mean, it just, it kind of opens up a tremendous amount of water for the city of Mitchell. So real quick, if you're speaking, just I've had a couple of people um, ask, just please turn on your mics and speak, and we do have some people watching on YouTube. You know, uh, like, I also like to mention, you know, the, the soybean plant. Um, they are not going to be fed by the city of Mitchell, it looks like, but they are going to be fed from the BY water line that feeds Mitchell. That then takes our MGD average from two to two and a half. So, I mean, that's once we look at bigger industries, if they did want to come to Mitchell, those big industries are kind of a game changer to our, our daily average because they are a constant. Um, so, f for these bigger industries, they're going to want to, to see that water increase. So, you know, that $60 million is a mind-blowing number. Are, when you think about that, are there sources of revenue? Are there opportunities for us to provide water for other communities using the, our line or anything else that would help to offset those costs? Potentially. I mean, we would, I mean, obviously we'd explore those now, but you wouldn't know and you couldn't get commitments until you, know, you had the water. Um, you know, Randall does serve um, Aurora Brule, um, Davison Rural Water um, along the way, but it's not to say that um, they would want to serve water to their customers through us, potentially. I mean, there's, it opens up possibilities that we don't currently have. I'm going to ask a question that Steve had asked, but the growth projections, because you and I talked about this earlier, that's just forecasting at our current growth rate. So Correct. if Mitchell were to have like a large industry that we're not anticipating come to town, then your future growth demands are going to be much higher than what was shown in the chart. That's a pretty conservative growth estimate based on what we've done in the past. I can't remember those five or ten years that they looked at, but... Based on their projections, it's not, it's just looking at us now. Correct. <clears throat>
And in terms of uh, state or federal monies, nothing like that is in the pipeline? I mean, anything is possible. I can't say that we would want to bank on it. Um, you know, like everything we bring here, I, I want us to plan for worst case scenario. And if we do get something, you know, that sweetens the pot. Um, you know, they are saying there are going to be some ARPA funds turned back to the state that we may potentially be able to um, receive. Um, I do think we'll, we'll get more into this during the, the rate study. Um, Randall has agreed to carry the debt for the project. Um, so basically, we'd be set up a payment plan with them. Therefore, it would not go against our constitutional <coughs> debt limit. Yep. Joe, why has our usage gone up? If the population has stayed pretty steady over the last 20 years, why are we, why is the usage going up so high? I mean, if you look at our average day, our average day is, is 2 million gallons per day. Um, you know, we're looking to move at 2.14, and our peaking factor is going to be 5.4 MGD, which we've seen up to um, 4.6. The issue run into as um, water distribution systems grow, you know, BY is growing, City of Mitchell is growing, um, that additional water that we've been using above the 2.65 starts to be reduced and reduced and reduced um, until, you know, you're in the situation where BY is having to make decisions on who's going to get the water and who isn't going to get the water. Now, we're not having that issue now, um, not to say that we won't down the road. We likely will when the soybean plant comes on. Well, I guess what it boils down to is we're using more than we're guaranteed um, to have access to now. So if you if you don't do something to secure additional water, you're going to be short from where we currently are now with, with or without rural. Correct. I'm about to ask a stupid question, and I know that. So let me preface that. But BY, Randall, Missouri, they all are the same water source, right? They're Correct. all right. Yep. So I don't know. Do you know? What I, do, you, do you see what I'm asking? I do. Without me asking that stupid question. And I have an answer to that question. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has told the state that the Missouri River will not run out of water. Ever? We can never say never, but hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean. Um, Rapid City is looking at possibly getting water from the Missouri River. Where so I mean, they have some different Back aquifers. Yeah. The, the guys sitting right here probably know way more about it than I do. But and I guess I'll, I'll let you know when there are no more questions. I'll introduce HDR, and then we'll start talking about the rate study. So, oh, that's what I was going to ask about, like, um, how long do we finance it over? We and don't. It, it, Randall carries the debt if we go with Randall. Oh, and so correct. Well, it's fine. We pay them a, a, it's built into the payment system we do it with. Yep. But so, it won't go against our constitutional debt. Okay, we, so. We look at paying it off over 30 years as far as the improvement cost goes. So our portion that's financed by Randall, but we're paying Randall, mm -hmm. um, is over 30 years, so. Yep. And Mr. Johnson will help with those agreements if, when, you know, that comes to fruition. Say, so Joe, uh, we had planned for a water storage facility. Yep. Just south of town. Wouldn't that alleviate the shortage? The, the reason we still would want to do that project is for the potential to uh, mix that water between Randall and BY. Um, they're very similar. They're a little different. Mixing would, would help a little bit. Um, the other reason is we're moving our pumping um, facility from the water treatment plant to that, that south area, and that allows us um, just some additional water sitting there to help us with our pump station to make sure that you know, we have it, um, adequate water to be pumped out into the system. Joe, I think you explained the second source obviously very well and, and the benefits of it um, and 
we're, we're to a point now where we've got to make some pretty large decisions. Yep. And um, as far as other cities in South Dakota or even in the Midwest, our size, um, what what percent or what do you think is the number of cities that do have a second source? Just out of curiosity. You know what off the top of your head, Gabe? You, you've explained the benefits of it, but you know, obviously, we're we're limited right now with just with the size that we're at, as we all talked. But there certainly has to be some cities that do have a second source. I'm assuming there are. You're correct. Okay, that's good enough. And I can get you those those statistics. So, how is our usage, daily usage, compared to other towns our size? I would say similar. I would say our, our industries might not necessarily be taking as much water as, say, Huron or um, some of those others. Do most cities put restrictions on, Joe, in the summer? Not all. I know some do. Okay. I don't think we, well, we've done, I think, in a very dry year, I think maybe we've we been asked. To, we've been asked more recently to put restrictions on from BY. Yep. Okay. Because of the amount we're using. Okay, that makes sense. I think a lot of communities have watering restrictions in the summer. To be honest, I see well, that quite. You a bit. you see, so like us, we when we set our watering restrictions, we you know the on off days right. or the odd even days. I know a lot of communities do do that. Um, I just don't know how well they are enforced. Right. True. It's more of a recommendation or suggestion, right. more than likely. So, BY, we're, if I remember right, we're the largest customer? Correct. Okay. By far, do you think? I want to say, if I remember right, we take about half okay. of their water. And that intake is, is it down by Springfield? Is that where? Um, just by Tabor, south and east of Tabor. Oh, Tabor. East of Springfield. Okay. okay. So would we keep um, the amount of water that we're currently using from BY the same and only supplement from Randall? Or would we start increasing our usage from Randall and take less from BY? It's preliminary. We're preliminary enough, I can't answer that question. But it's safe to say that they would compete against each other. Certainly. Yeah. And where are we at with the contract with BY right now? Can we sign an extension? I guess I can answer that one for you, Jeff. Um, we're still under the original contract. Um, that one is effective uh, through 2050. And then we have the option to extend that for several, I believe, four additional 25-year terms if we wanted to. Um, so theoretically, we've got the choice to do it through 2150. And I believe the thing that you're also referring to, Jeff, is we brought to council in November or October um, purchasing their 20% rights to the mile of line between the new ground storage tank and their existing meter pit. I'll let you want to respond to where we're at with that, Justin? Um, I guess we're, we approved it, as Joe said, several months ago. Um, we're still waiting for BY to give their formal approval to that agreement and to sign off on it. Um, I last reached out to their attorney just before the end of the new year and never heard back from him as to what else they were looking for from us. We so thought we had that agreement all hammered out and everybody was on the same page, but now it appears we're not. So from Springfield to Mitchell, or Tabor to Mitchell, we own... 80% of the line, is that what I'm getting at? From trip to Mitchell. Yep, from trip to Correct. Okay. And it's a 24-inch line? Correct. So I know we're going to, 
leave everything on the table and kind of learn together, obviously, as we walk through this. But realistically, the intake of our own, the $150 million, <coughs> is a pretty large step. Really big. And we're in the business competing against Randall and BY yep. at that point. Yeah, um, lo logistics. We now have a plant in Chamberlain that we we need someone to work right. at and operate and so I, I guess again we're going to keep everything on the table but realistically that's probably not a legitimate option is it it's a lot to bite off yeah I would assume Joe that of that these other alternatives the Randall water is a they're going to finance us where the others we'd have to figure out how we're going to pay for it right that, that'd be accurate yep correct the difference is either way we're going to have to pay for it the only difference being whether we're carrying the debt or not right. but right. either way we're going to have a debt service payment either to randall or that we're paying directly <clears throat> to our loan and jeff further on i don't know if you were maybe going to go through them all a little bit but i really question the Lake Mitchell one also. I, I I don't see that really being even part of something that should be on the table, to be honest with you. I mean, right now, I, you know, I was around back in the days. We pumped from the James River all the time and went down there and thank God it didn't fall in. But when we did it all the time, it ran short. And right now, if you go out to Lake Mitchell, Lake Mitchell is considerably down right now. It's the first time I've seen beachfronts in front of all these lakes, in front of all the houses. So right now, it's at that situation where we're concerned right now, and let alone pumping out water and having 40% 40, 40 waste of it, I just don't know if it's something to even be considered on the table either. I think it goes back to BY, Randall, and then the Missouri River intake. I question that a little bit too. I think it's coming down to two of them in my mind. But There is I'm, no more ability to bring water from the Jim River to Lake Mitchell either. That's, yeah, that's, that's over. That is correct, yep. So, so I really think that one is one that might need to be almost removed too in a round way. But I mean, like you said, keep them on the table, but it's something I believe the citizens would be... <laughs> Not in favor of either. So. Well, especially when you're needing 4.5 million gallons to make 2.5, and I believe that's why you originally dug dug out the west end of the lake because it was not producing enough water at what it was. So, just don't know if you're going to make any gains. Right. And Joe, when the soybean plant comes to town, in my mind, that's going to affect us big time. I'm sure because they're going to get the water before we do. That's going to slow our process down, doesn't it? It will. Um, Contractually, it's it's fine, but again, you know, um, BY is giving us water above the 2.65, um, and I don't, I can't say whether or not it will affect us um, from a BY standpoint or not. You would just think it would when they use that much water. Were we to do any of these, what it, kind of a timeline are we looking at? Um, Best case scenario, we would want to be, we would want to have our additional water in 26 or 27. That'd be ideal situation. Yep. So I guess with that, we could probably turn it over to HDR to talk about our rate study. Um, and they actually are going to talk about also how um, the Randall project um, would affect our rates. Um, moving forward. So with that, I will turn it over to, um, we have Sean Korn with us, um, Gabe Lauber, and Bill Moran from HR with us. So. I drew the short straw. Good evening, everybody. Sean Korn with HR Engineering. I work uh, and lead our utility rates and finance group. And so this is what I do day in and day out, is develop rate studies of this nature that we've developed for you all. So this evening, as we go through this, looking for any questions and comments, any thumbs up, thumbs down as we go through some of the assumptions and analysis. And then as Joe said, we're going to present the preliminary results that we have from the study today. And we'll get all the way through to the rate design component so you can see what those rates and even potential bill impacts may be. So I'll start off with the purpose of the study and overview the rate study process. We'll then we'll jump into the numbers and then talk about the summary and the next steps. Maybe. There we go. Oops, skip one now. 
So as we go through the rate study, as we worked with staff, we kind of outlined some key goals and objectives as we kick this off. And obviously the first one is that we develop rates that generate sufficient revenue to support your operating and capital needs. So that's kind of our number one goal. It's kind of a given goal, but it's what we're really desiring as we go through this process. So we work with staff to develop those projections that I'll talk about. The second part is developing equitable and cost-based rates. So this really gets into thinking about how your customers use the system. So how a residential customer uses that versus a commercial customer versus an industrial customer. Because each of those customers utilizes the system in a different way. Staff have to design the system to meet each of those peak needs for the water side or the type of wastewater that's being generated that goes to the plant to be treated. And those vary from customer types. When we go through this process, we also think about how and why you incur those costs and who <coughs> should fund their co those costs proportionally between those different customers. When we develop this, we develop it as if it's a business. They're enterprise funds, they're standalone funds, and so we want to make sure that we take into consideration key financial criteria. So some of that is maintaining adequate reserve levels. So if something goes bump, we, and we have to fund it, or if there's a shortfall in revenue, it's a really dry year on the water side, or sorry, really wet year on the water side, and we have to, we're short on revenues, we want to make sure we fund that. We also have some financial requirements related to debt service, making sure we're adequately meeting our debt service coverage ratio, so that credit check when you issued that debt back in the day. And then ultimately, are we reinvesting in the system at an adequate level? So that's one of the key things that I see as I work with utilities, is that's the piece that goes away. We pay our debt, we pay our O&M, what falls off the table is our reinvestment in the system from our rate levels. So you know, depreciation expense, those kind of fundings that we need on an annual basis just to maintain the system. So at home, it's putting new tires on the car, new roof on the house, those types of things from a utility basis. And we do that using generally accepted methodologies, but tailored around your specific system, costs, and customer characteristics. So this is really based on your budgeting and your customer information. I'm not doing very well with this thing this evening. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, and now I'm going too far, right? Yeah, it's just slow, I think. So the, this, there's a three-step process that we go through that's outlined in our generally accepted approaches. The first one's the revenue requirement. That's the financial plan. How, what does our O&M expenses look like over the time frame, and how are we paying for our capital improvements? Are we looking at long-term debt? Are we funding it through reserves? Or are we funding that through rates? <coughs> then we get into the equity or proportionality discussion in the cost of service analysis. That's where we dive into the customer characteristics, the system costs, why and how we incur those costs, and who should fund those through their rates. And then we design rates to meet those first two steps. And this is a sequential process. We develop the revenue requirement, we allocate and distribute the costs, and then we design rates to reflect those overall levels so that we have overall revenues to support the utilities, each individually, plus we have our intra-class, so residential, commercial, industrial rates developed as part of this process. So I'll dive a little bit into the revenue requirement. As I mentioned, we're simply comparing revenues to expenses, but the key element of that part of the study is really looking at the capital plan and how we're paying for those projects. If we issue debt service, then that needs to come up through the debt service component so that we fund that annually. If we're using reserves, we want to make sure that we're able to replenish those reserves over time. So that analysis, this analysis essentially provides us with that overall basis. I mentioned we want to meet our prudent financial planning metrics, so debt service coverage ratio, ending reserve balances. When we develop this, we develop it for a five to ten year period. So we put a model together that goes out ten years. We focused on the next five years just to see what that looks like because we can really kind of hone in on that data and information and have good assumptions as we go forward. We start getting to year six to ten, we're starting to guess a little bit more. Ten to twenty, we're really starting to guess at what may happen, right? So we're really trying to focus in on those. For rate setting, it's generally a two to five year, and that's a pretty general statement for utilities across the country is we either adopt a couple years or we adopt multiple years as we go forward. 
As an enterprise fund and a standalone utility, the rates you receive from your water and wastewater customers are the revenues that support all your costs. So the analysis assumes no transfers from other city funds into the water and sewer. It's simply based on the total revenues you receive from customers through those bills that are sent out. We use what's known as the cash basis approach, uh, simply a term stolen from the accounting side, but it really aligns nicely with your overall budgeting process. We look at each year's costs in a silo and then carry that over the five to 10 year period. So some key assumptions as we go through this, we recalculate the revenues based on actual billing data. So we looked at how much water did you sell? How many customers are out there? And develop that profile. And that's our first check as we go through the study and compare that to what your actuals were. That gives us our units and our customer characteristics that we can then use in the cost of service and rate design. We started with the 2022 budget for each utility. We projected those out the 10 years out to 2032 based on some historical inflationary factors as we went forward. Uh, just a couple key assumptions as we go through this. On the wastewater side, we've included some additional O&M for treatment and expansion program projects. So when we look at the capital plan and we have those improvements, we've built in some additional costs that ref reflected or related to those projects. And on the water side, as Joe alluded to, then we've built in some assumptions for water purchases through Randall World Water. And so that would start at the end of 2025 and carry out into the rest of the years. As we start looking at the capital plan, there's some different types of projects that are included. We have some renewal and replacement, just maintaining the system. We have improvements or betterments on the system and some expansion projects. So in order to complete those projects, then we have some long-term borrowing assumed as part of this. Really, uh, at this point, we've assumed low interest loan funding from 2022 through 2026. And really that's kind of the 2022 is the ongoing projects that you have right now that you have the approved loans for. So I'll start off with the water side. This is a graphic of the annual capital improvements. So starting in 22, going out to 27, our projected years are 2023 to 2027. The total capital is kind of that gray behind, but you can see it, it matches the top of each of those bars. In 2022, we had the source and storage project. So that's what we have the existing low interest loan program that's been approved for. That's the dark blue in there. The orange is where we're using a little bit of reserves, and then the black on the bottom is our annual rate funding. That's that reinvestment into the system on an annual basis. Going across then in 2023 through 2027, you can see it runs at about $2.5 million a year. That's funded primarily through annual rate funded capital, so that reinvestment in the system. But then we also do pull some funds out of reserves in a couple of years. And we do issue some additional long-term debt to fund a couple of the projects. And on the water side, those future projects that we're looking at debt for are some of the big pipeline replacement projects that are on, on the capital plan today. So there's just not sufficient revenue or reserves at this point in time where we can cash finance those. So for the time being, we've assumed this assumption here to fund those projects. Now, when we think about our total revenue requirement, then that's made up of our O&M expenses and our debt service and any reserve funding that we have as part of that. So I split this chart up into a couple pieces just so you can see how it ties out. The black bar across the bottom, that's our annual O&M expenses. The blue, light blue, is the water purchases. So you can see from 22 to 24, that's our BY water purchases. When we jump out to 25, 26, and 27, that is our combined BY and Randall water purchases. So you can see there's that step up there. That's really driven by the overall financing of that project. So as was mentioned, Randall would carry the debt and essentially that would be the debt service payment through that process. But we're not purchasing more water. It's both built in there. So we made an assumption that we would be paying the debt portion plus <clears throat> buying some water from Randall as part of this scenario right here. R right. You still have the investment of the second source, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's included in the light blue. Yes. Is the, per the second source structure. The okay. Correct. Yes. This would be all in. And again, the, the BY number kind of carry or 
the BY purchases are kind of stay at that level, right? Kind of go across. Um, obviously, some increase in that, but ultimately, it's the the Randall Water that is that debt payment, and then the annual purchase of of water from them. Of additional. Additional, yes. But it's still going to be net the same as where we're at now because we're not forecasting buying a lot more water than what we're buying now. It's just the total combined. Correct. It, so and our, our BY bill goes down? It's going to depend on how, how it all determines, right, as it goes through. So essentially we have, we're, you, you're going to have to pay the debt portion for, for the improvements on Randall. That's a big chunk of the light blue in there. And then it's how that shifts between BY and Randall over time, depending on what that overall charge is going to be for both of them, or the rate that they charge you. So on the rate they charge you, which one's got a lesson right now? I don't know that we have. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, BY, I believe, um, would be cheaper. Uh, to what point? I mean, we're, we're still very preliminary. I mean, we, you need, we need a um, path forward and able to start negotiating those items. So on top of that, light blue is the dark blue. That's the rate funded capital. That's the bottom bar from the prior chart that we carry forward. That's what we're reinvesting in the system on an annual basis. And then the green is our net debt service. And so remember we have some, a current low interest loan program for the water project. That's jumping in, so you can see the change in the green from 22 to 23. That's that additional debt service as part of that low interest loan. That essentially carries at that level till you get out to 25, and then there's those couple blips that are added when we looked at the capital plan as part of that. The dashed line that's essentially horizontal, that is our current revenues for the water utility. So as you can see, as we go out, we've projected you know, minimal growth on the system. That line's tipped up just a little bit as we go out, but you can see as we jump into 23, 24, and so on, then even into 23 and 24 before we have any Randall purchases, then our revenues are not sufficient to fund that debt service going forward. So that's kind of what we miss in 23. The dashed line that touches the top of each of the bars, that would be the level of revenue that's necessary to fund that. And I'll show you here in a couple slides what that impact would be on rates. Uh, to fund that overall improvement. And I'm sorry if I'm asking no, you're too good. many questions. And is the assumption that for 30 years, those that line will continue to increase slightly, just you know, with the rate of inflation or whatever, uh, but it would stay up there. Yeah. So when um, you, I mean that. Yeah, um, when you get to 26, 27, and out, it flattens out. Um, the big hurdle is getting up to you know, 23, 24, 25, those three years are the big hurdle to get sure. up to. And then once you're there, assuming the capital plan we have today is the capital plan that happens in the next 10 years, then I would say, yes, it's somewhat of a glide pattern as part of that. So that's the water side. On the wastewater side, then very similar setup as I clicked. So I don't want to click too many slides here. There we go. Thank you. Uh, this is the capital plan. See, I didn't know we knew that would happen. Uh, got it. <laughs> uh, when we look at the wastewater uh, capital plan, then you can see this very similar approach here. 2022, we've got our existing low interest loan program for the Headworks project. As we go into 23, 24, and 25, that's the south treatment plant improvements that are planned. We've assumed a low interest loan to fund that. Uh, and then you can see it runs again at about just around $2 million where the black bars are. That's our rate funded capital component. So again, some current long-term debt plan to fund it, current projects going on and then some planned future improvements as part of this as well uh, for the South plant related to your needs. So Joe had mentioned the soybean plant earlier. This would exclude any of the capital costs related to the soybean plant. So that would be a different discussion as part of that. These are the, the city costs as part of this at the South treatment plant for the improvements there. So taking that forward to that same revenue requirement assumption, again, the black bar at the bottom is our O&M expenses. 
And then we have our dark blue, which is our rate funded capital. That's that annual reinvestment in the system. And then we have our existing debt in the green. And then as you see going into 2023, then that bar steps up where we have that additional component. Now, what you also notice is that blue bar kind of steps down as we go out. So what we were trying to do is to transition rates as smoothly as we could over these first three years. So we would fund with rate revenue as much as we could and then try to layer the debt service in on top of that to try and get a nice glide path as part of that as well. Wastewater, once we get up to that rate level in 2025, then it is a much slower step up. It kind of looks a little differently here just because of the scale on the graph. But ultimately, once we get through that first year, then it's really more inflationary driven as we go out over time as part of that. The orange is the reserve funding. So you see out in 25, 26, and 27 between the blue and green, you'll see little slivers of orange. That's putting money back into reserves. In 25 and 20, or sorry, 23 and 24, you'll see orange at the bottom. It's a negative number there. That's because even with the proposed rate adjustments that we're building in, we're still pulling out of reserves so that we actually fund because that dashed line that goes up to the top isn't all the way to the top of those two bars in 23 and 24. So again, we're still short essentially, but we have sufficient reserves on the wastewater side to be able to minimize those one-time rate adjustments and transition that in over time. So what does this look like? So rate adjustments are necessary really simply to fund our current O&M as well as annual debt service payments just on the planned debt service that we have in place today. As we go forward and fund those future capital projects, there's additional future plan debt. And then it's really trying to maintain our reserve levels at adequate levels as part of this. So as you look at this, this is just kind of an across the board adjustment. When we get into the cost of service, I'm gonna talk a little bit about changing the rate structure slightly. <coughs> so these rates will look a little different when we get to the last couple of slides. But that average customer bill for water today is about $38.26. That's based on seven units of water. A unit is a CCF. Each unit is 748 gallons. That's how you bill is in those units. That would, you can see, increase $11, $13, $15, and so on as we go out. So to the question of, you know, how, how does this transition in as we get into 26 and 27, then you can see it's, it's starting to ramp down and we don't have such a large increase in those overall rate needs to fund the operating capital expenses. On the wastewater side, current average bill at five units is $39. And then you can see the one-time step up. And then it's really more of the inflationary amount, $2.83 all the way out to $1.77 increase each year. So once we get up on wastewater, we're in a good spot. On the water side, it's a couple year, three-year transition to get to where we need to be to fund our overall operating capital needs. Do you want to save me the math and tell me what that jump is from 2023 to 27 for a single family um, with wastewater and regular, regular water included. I'm just thinking how they're going to be thinking. So, so we're looking at 23. So on wastewater, we go up about 32% the first year. And so we're, I think it's about a 70% overall increase in the five years on wastewater. On water, it's just slightly over 100%. So it's essentially doubling the 38 going up to 84. So it's a little over 100% increase on that. And again, that's really driven on ex new debt coming on sure. uh, for existing projects and then the future project needs. On the water side, it also builds in the Randall purchases as part of that. So it might be helpful to hear when you're saying seven units, what that equates to for us, Joe? Uh, yep, seven units is roughly 5,000 gallons. Yeah. That's what we normally yeah, thank you. And that's what a four-person household or? So, like my family right now, um, with three kids, little kids, we use roughly two to three thousand gallons a month. So you're probably looking at, you know, two to four kids, roughly older, who, you know, shower more and all that good stuff. Yep. I'm higher than that. My husband, right? So three kids are sure. And my teenagers use way more than that. So, <laughs> so basically, by 2027, the average bills will be about 145 bucks. 
Combined, yes. Yeah, combined. Yes. Come on. And, and this was the solution with Randall that you're looking at? That is correct. Okay. And I, yeah. I want to say, I know in our previous conversation, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, just the, the Randall um, increased was 33% from where we needed to be? About that, yes. I don't remember the exact number either, but yeah, it was, it was a third of that increase was driven by the Randall component. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of, a, to me, that was eye-opening to hear um, that that's kind of how far behind we are, that even with a you know, $60 million project increase, it only technically raises our bill by 33%. I was going to jump back, and now it's probably not going to let me. But uh, here we go. On the water side, really, you know, one of the key drivers that we have is the the debt right now for the source and storage project in 2022. So as that starts coming on, that drives that debt service up. So that's a big chunk of that as well. So that's about $16 million, give or take, of debt that that we're paying off on the on the water side. So some of this of what you're seeing has already been in our previous conversations when Joe showed you what our rates will need to get to to be able to fund that $60 million plus worth of projects that we have listed. <clears throat> So one of the other key statistics is looking at reserves. So as we think about this on the left-hand side in blue is the water, right-hand side in green is the sewer. Looking at the top left, our operating ending reserve fund, that's based on our target of 90 days of O&M expenses. That's a pretty typical target that we use in, in the industry and many municipalities use that as well. Uh, and so you see the red line is that target. You see the step up in 2025 because Randall would be included as an O&M expense as part of that. So we left that kind of at that level going across and didn't use much more of the reserves so that we would meet our ending target. The bottom left is our capital reserve. So that's one that essentially floats each year. Uh, so we have some money we put in there in one year, then we take it out and use that over the time frame. Ideally, in a capital reserve, we're looking at an average of one year's capital expenses. And I'd kick out the big stuff, you know, like the head works on the wastewater or even the source and storage on the water when I look at what that target would be. But that's a general recommendation of looking at, at that target. On the wastewater side, on the top right hand, you can see we do have adequate reserves. Again, that orange is our 90 days of O&M minimum target, and I'll stress the minimum. That doesn't mean we necessarily want to bring reserves down to that level. It's, that's our floor. When we hit our floor, we know we need to make some corrective action, or if we see those reserves trending down, and we've held them essentially flat at just over a million dollars. And then you'll see on the bottom right, we're bringing up reserves a little bit as we get into the out years for the capital side for the wastewater. That's driven by a couple things. One, starting to establish that wastewater capital reserve. And then secondly is for storm sewer projects as we built into this some additional funding for that that would ultimately be used in the future for those improvements. None of those, they're not outlined right now, but we started to build that reserve for those projects that you've done in the past. So once we know what the level of rates is or how much we need to collect, we go into the cost of service. Really, what is a cost of service? It's an, a, an analysis to proportionally distribute those costs to the, each of the different customer classes of service. So for water, we're looking at residential and commercial. You really don't have too much of the industrial base here on the water side. And if the soybean plant comes in, that's going to be outside of your service. That's going to be through BY. Why do we do the cost of service? It's really to try and come back to as best we can fair and equitable rates. And I'll use, you'll hear me say proportional probably more often than fair because if we all get the same bill, some of us are going to think that's not fair, right? So we're looking at how they use the system and how they drive those costs. And what it tells us when we get to the end of the cost of service is do our rates adequately reflect the rates that are in place today, the proportionality between customers. So the way residential customers use water versus commercial or on the sewer side, how residential and commercial wastewater generates the cost versus an industrial customer. 
And so as we look at that, there's different requirements as part of that. So as we go through that, that's what it tells us is do we have subsidies in our rates today that somebody should be paying more and somebody less? And so this is just one of those tools in the toolbox that we want to take into consideration as we establish rates so that when folks look at the rate structure or their bill, they understand the reason why, because those are the costs that are incurred to provide that service. So when we look at water, it's really driven by average day needs and peak day needs. It's as simple as that. You have to size the system to meet those needs, so those customers that drive the needs should pay that. Uh, as we go through this process, there's really no uh, overall change recommended on the water side. Uh, the analysis came out very what I'll call clean, and what that means is, is when we look at the overall costs that are allocated and distributed to the class, they roughly equal the revenue that they're bringing in today. So that means that we're fairly even on the water side. On the wastewater side, it's really driven by the volumes. So how much wastewater is generated and sent to the plant? What is the cost of treating that wastewater as part of that? Now, one change, essentially, as we start thinking about how we look at the cost, is how we allocate and distribute costs and facilities to your industrial customers. So the current primary industrial customer that you have in place today sits right out there next to the plant. And so really there's no distribution, or sorry, collection system that provides them service. So think of all the small sewer pipes running through all the neighborhoods. There's no benefit to them of those pipes because that's all for all your typical co other customers that are out there. Soybean plant, that's going to be coming straight into the south plant. So there's really not going to be any dis collection or other system component of that as well. So we've allocated costs in that manner to reflect those costs. What we're seeing is that there should be a change in the cost of service for commercial customers and industrial customers. So right now you have a single rate structure that's applied to everybody. What you're going to see here as an alternative in a moment is that we have separate rate structures for residential, commercial, and industrial on the wastewater side to reflect how those customer classes are impacting the system as we go forward. So when we looked at that cost of service results, uh, this is something that I'll talk about baby steps in. <coughs> so we see the cost of service results. I don't want to jump to them 100% today because as we start looking at customer characteristics and the price signal that folks may get from the new rates, that can change how they utilize the system. So this is one point in time. This is one step in that direction. And as you move forward and evaluate this in future years, then you can look at those overall costs and say, okay, we need to do another step up for this customer group or that customer group as we go forward. So based on the revenue requirement and cost of service, we can come into our rate design, and really that's our goal here for rate design is to make sure we collect adequate revenues and we collect them equitably and proportionally between our customer classes of service. So as we develop this, as I mentioned, we took two, we have two alternatives here for discussion. The first one is status quo. So maintaining the current rate structure, single rate structure for water for everybody, single rate structure on the wastewater side for everybody, with the exception of pushing a little more of the cost to the fixed side. So we, on, on the both rate structures, we have a fixed charge, and then we have a consumption or volumetric charge. And we're saying, looking at the overall revenue needs, let's try and increase the fixed revenue collection that we have. And one reason I'm recommending that is because of the existing debt and future debt we're looking at funding for those capital improvements to try and maintain that overall level of costs so that the, the revenues equals the cost a little bit better. The alternatives for water, then we're looking at increasing that fixed charge uh, as well as charging that by meter size. So right now everybody pays the same fixed charge. What this alternative does is it looks at the size of the meter and it says this is the capacity that you as a customer can place on the system because you have a two inch or a six inch meter. That capacity is a much higher driver in cost than what a three quarter inch or a one inch meter would be out there. So this would have a graduated scale based on the meter capacities that would be larger for the higher, fix, the higher meter, si larger meter sizes. And then we balance that with the consumption charge or the variable charge component. On wastewater, the alternative is to develop a rates by class of service, as I mentioned, residential, commercial, and industrial. 
as well as push those fixed charges up as part of that. So again, trying to increase the fixed revenue generation to meet those overall fixed costs you have. So here is the water alternative. The top box is the status quo. So right now, everybody pays $9.21. That would increase to $13.80. And then you can see how that increases about $4 per year uh, until we get out to 26 and 27. And then you can see the consumption charge. So all water, uniform rate, the same price for, all, for however much you use is $4.15 today, increasing to $5.20 and so on as we go out. The alternative on the bottom shows you the fixed charge by meter size. So a one inch and less meter, which is the vast majority of your customers and, and primarily your residential customers, would have that $13 fixed charge. And then you can see as you get up to a four or six inch meter, then that's $130 or $260 respectively. That's based on the capacity of that meter. So each meter has a certain amount of water it can push through it. That's the, ver the ratio of that to a one inch meter as part of that. Then we have the consumption charge, still a uniform rate, so the same rate for all water use. And you can see that increases over time, but ultimately with that fixed meter charge, even starting at $13 for a one inch and less, we have a little savings on the consumption side. It's a little lower than the status quo because we're collecting some additional fixed revenue from those larger meters that place those demands on the system. On the wastewater, I had to split this up a little bit. This is the, the status quo. So this is just taking what you have today. Everybody pays the $22 and then $3.40. Uh, again, going out, we've increased that fixed charge to $29, increasing to $34, and then the volumetric charge from $340 up to $530. Again, that funds all of our, as with water, both scenarios fund all of the O&M and capital needs that we have as part of this. The alternative then, is to split this up into three customer classes. And when we looked at the cost of service, uh, one of the primary drivers that we look at is total volume to the plant. And when we started looking at the amount of wastewater that's generated from a residential customer versus a commercial customer, commercial customers made up more on a proportional basis or percentage basis of the cost, or sorry, of the volumes than a residential. So it showed that their rates should go up a little bit more than what the residential should. And then we have a different rate for industrial based on how they utilize the system. So in this case, we go to the same 2905 and 2023 for the fixed charge. That's the same for all customers. But what you'll see in 2023 coming down that second column is the volume charge for residential would be $4. It would be $5 for non-residential and it would be $3.98 for industrial. Now that difference, the 398 versus the four or the five, is because they don't have costs allocated to them for the conveyance and collection system that's all part of town that they don't benefit from as part of that. So that's that differential as part of that. And there is another charge that they do pay here. In a second, I'll show you. They do have the industrial surcharges if their strengths are higher, then there's an additional bill that they receive for that. So that's the key difference here when you look at this alternative is that we'd have a different rate structure specific to residential, non-residential, and then our industrial cut. But it's so slight. I'm anxious. I guess I'm anxious to see the <laughs> surcharge because I'm like, that's not what I thought the chart was going to look like. It, so it's, it's interesting. So when we looked at the cost of service, by increasing non-residential to that $5 <laughs> and being able to keep the residential down a bit, it does have that benefit in revenue generation and then minimizing the impacts to the residential customers based on how they use it. My assumption was that the industrial would go up, but it doesn't. And that's pretty typical. Uh, when we think about how they use the system, they're, you know, generally they're only discharge, even if they weren't right next to the plant, they're generally discharging into the larger pipes. They're coming right into one of the big conveyance or trunk lines they're not benefiting from all the smaller pipe in the neighborhoods. And so when we think about how we go through this process, that's the key driver. It's very similar to if you had a wholesale water customer. They probably wouldn't be allocated a bunch of your distribution system because it's of no benefit to them when you went through a contract process with that. So that's the key difference for them. Now, when we go to the next slide here, 
now you're going to see a change because what you're doing at the south treatment plant is improving that system to meet some of the treatment requirements. So up at the top on the left, you'll see your present surcharge program for your industrial pro, uh, customers. There's a surcharge 27 cents for volume, 22 cents per pound of BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, 21 cents for TSS or total suspended solids, and then no charge today for TKN, essentially our nitrogen, total nitrogen component of the rate. Go to the red numbers there in 2023. Uh, we're taking away, or I'd recommend no volume component surcharge. Uh, I'm not sure where, what the genesis of that was back in the day, uh, but ultimately there's not a volume charge. We already picked that up in the current rate that we have in place today. But then when we look at our BOD, it's 88 cents <coughs> per pound now. $1.29 for TSS and $4.80 for TKN. That's a charge that's not in place today, but would be recommended based on the reason why you're doing the improvements that you are at the plant. And those are things that are, that we are doing to the water? I'm, I'm trying to understand yes. those charges. That we, there are special things that we are, an added value for them that we're doing for them. I wouldn't say added value to them. What it is is you have to meet specific effluent discharge requirements. So the water has to be clean when it comes out. And, and you're talking to a rate guy. We might have to hit the wastewater guys over here. But um, essentially there's certain processes that you do at the plant to meet those requirements. Some of the new stuff drives the cost for the TKN to take that out. So if that industrial customer is over a certain level of strength, then they pay this surcharge. So as an example, right now, your one primary industrial customer pay, would pay this or has paid this for the BOD side, a little bit into the TSS as part of that. So there is a cost associated with what you're providing because the higher strength of the waste, the harder and more costly it is to treat that to get it cleaner to be able to discharge it. And it's not necessary to do with a residential or a non-residential? Uh, well, Yes, we do treat it to the required effluent discharge amount, so it's as clean as it's supposed to be, but their waste is, is less nasty. It's easier to treat than what the They're industrial not, waste is. Right, industrial waste is putting a lot more things down that yes. pipe than, than a resident's is. So this isn't an everyday charge for them, but it just depends on what they're doing as part of their process. Asking questions that everybody else in the room knows the answers. Nope, That's this is good. No, nope, this is this is a tricky one. And if you look at the bottom, we pulled some some other folks out here. So we've got uh, Aberdeen and Watertown. We found some relatively uh, easy ones to find here. And you can see on the graph for BOD, TSS, and TKN, it's all over the board. And it's going to be that way if you want to look at one of the other municipalities in the area because it's individual. It's based on your specific treatment process and the costs associated with that. So as EPA is going around and changing people's permits, we're seeing more and more of these come into play because we're having to treat to a higher level and there's costs associated with that. So last slide here is our comparison. And I always start this out by saying this is not an apples to apples. This is a point in time today but ultimately it looks at what your rates are versus other in the region. And so what we did is we found the latest rates for each of these agencies. We assumed our 5,000 gallons per month <coughs> bill. So this is typ our typical residential bill comparison as part of that. <coughs> and the other reason why I say it's not an apples to apples is because many of these agencies are going through similar projects and, and needs as you are. It's just when. Have they already done it? Have they not done it? Are they going to do it going forward? So if you look on the left, we've got our present rate. Uh, you'll see the water bill and the sewer bill. Again, water blue, sewer green at 5,000 gallons, and then the total bill underneath that. And you can see the proposed bumps us up there kind of towards the top end of that. But again, as we go through this, we know that many folks are doing additional projects or doing studies right now. Rapid City is going to be going through a study soon here to evaluate their water and wastewater water rates and Sioux Falls has some annual increases planned as they go forward 
And um, a couple others, if we need to get into details, Gabe has some details on what some of these are. Uh, was it Yankton that's jumping up so hard? Uh, Yankton's jumping up pretty significantly. Their fixed component is going up a couple dollars a year per month uh, going forward. I think they end at about $34, $35 uh, for just their fixed component. So pretty close to where we're Beyond looking what, at here. What this is? Correct, yes, this is what it is today. Yep. And, and next year they implement a first, next year or this year? This year. This year they implemented the first change and it was jumped it up from $11 to about 17 and then it just keeps going from there for the next four or five years. Something Absolutely. That might be because we are farther ahead in issuing yep. our projects. We were already underway planning a lot of these infrastructure projects before the ARPA money came out. So we're maybe a step ahead of some of the other groups that started planning a little bit later. So you'll probably see our right rates jump up before some of the other ones. And, and we'll see this pretty frequently. Somebody steps up, and then pretty soon everybody else has stepped up with them. And then the next person has to go, right? And the next agency has to go. And they bump up, and then pretty soon everybody follows. Because you're all going to be facing the same requirements, essentially, uh, you know, from a wastewater effluent discharge permit requirement. On the water needs, it's just driven on what your overall source of supply when is. does that all ability. have to be taken place by what? 2027? What's that? The federal guidelines. 26. 26. So with that, I will wrap up here. And uh, really, as I mentioned, looking for some feedback, input, questions. Uh, we'll come back. We'll work in any input that you all have. Essentially, I'll call it, quote, finalize. Our study is part of that. Then we'll be back in front of you with a report as well as a presentation for the final approach to move forward as the council uh, determines is necessary uh, to fund your operating capital needs. So with that, I will turn it back to you all for any additional questions. Or did I wear you out? You did very well. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, do we have anybody right now that uh, just uses our our uh, sewer and and not purchasing water? And the reason I'm asking this is I, I picked up that the soybean plant is going to be discharging, but if they if they buy directly from BY, the, the lake house used to do just sewer. They buy water. We it's more normal to have just water and not sewer. Because we do have, we still have some areas that maybe have septic, or if we serve, um, say, more of a rural customer on our outlying lines. Um, yeah. And obviously, jumping way ahead, but if that's the way it's set up, as far as the sewer is concerned, can you set up, or can we set up special rates for just that situ that type of situation? For just a typical customer or a residential no. customer? Well, uh, for a large user. You're saying yes. bulk, like a large bulk user. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and that's something that I worked with Joe on when we were helping them look through the, the soybean plant assumptions. I have a whole other model that we looked at when we were doing that. So, yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things we talked about is you may, you may end up with an industrial customer on the other side of town. Well, then they obviously benefit from the conveyance system that goes through town to the plants. And so in that case, then there may be a slightly different rate for them, or they would have to make some improvements to your system before they connect so that they can pay that rate. That's really what we're trying to get back to is that equitability between customers so they pay their share of costs. So there, we can go through and develop that based on what we've done today. It gives us that starting point to evaluate what those rates could look like. The way I got that when we first started looking at this is that whoever the new customer is, they look at the unique circumstances for that customer, set a rate and a contract based on what the unique circumstances are. If yep. that customer is providing their own infrastructure, then it's going to be different. Yep. If they don't need the distribution center, then it's going to be different. If, so it really allows us to customize it to what they're using for the non-engineers in the <laughs> <laughs> have, have you all looked at uh, and considered low volume using, using customers? I mean, you said here's the minimum. How many are well below that minimum? 
or, you know, then Stephanie made a comment that her household uses more. So, you know, it should be a fair and equitable billing system. How many of the folks that are paying the minimum actually use three-fourths of minimum or half of minimum? Single family or single person living in a house versus a family of four. They both probably get billed the minimum. Right now they do. Correct. And that's why when you look at, say, this um, chart for water, um, they look at you know the equitable um, distribution of the dollars from the one inch and less all the way down to the six inch. So that, that's a way to um, help distinguish between your residential user versus your, say, your, your hotel. Yeah. And then for a comparison, my usage compared to what Joe's family usage is, I pay more because I'm paying per unit charge. Everyone starts with that same base, yeah. but then if you're a bigger user, you're right. paying for more use the more you go. I understand that makes sense, but my point was how about the people that use well less than the minimum? Well, they would fall on, they would get charged less for the water use, that bottom number. Yeah, so everybody pays the 921, regardless of use. And then we add to it, based on their use, the, you know, in this case, the current uh, $4.15 per unit they would pay. So if you use so one unit, you add 415 to If you to use 750, yep. 750 gallons, you would get another $4.15 charge. Yep. If you use... 1,500 gallons, you'd get two times that $4.15 yep. added to your bill. Didn't I hear something about uh, the minimum billing is seven units, which would equate to 5000 that, that was an example. Yeah. That was an example only. Just if you were to have seven units and then there was a five unit. So we, yep. we try to compare 5,000 gallon user is your typical residential family, or on average. So that's the number that we look at when we're comparing rates from where we are now to say where we may be in the future or where we have been. So in this one, where it's showing 6.7 units, someone who's only using two units is going to have less of the less. bill. Less, correct. Less of the rate charge. And that should be. Yep. Right. And I think that's a valid question, John, because, you know, we, we can, however we, if we move forward with this, whatever we do with the base, we know what the end number has to be. So if we lower the base, then we have to we have to increase yep. the the user rates. Yep. So it's it's worth throwing it out there. And that's something we we went back and forth on with staff is we looked at a couple different options of you know the 1380 you know from 921 to 1380 or do we go to you know a dollar a year increase in that? And one of the pieces that I looked at is looking at what your debt load is going to be going forward just with what we have today and saying okay this would be roughly that fixed charge that's roughly what everybody would would have to pay as part of that now you're right that's that's an answer right so as you mentioned if we want to push less on fixed more on the variable we can do that we're just going to we're going to hit the same revenue number it's just how do we want to collect that Any more questions for anybody, I wonder? Um, we'll have, are there any more questions on the presentation itself that we can? Otherwise, we'll have Joe kind of walk through maybe what our next steps are going to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this is uh, steps moving forward are you know, open to, uh, to change, but uh, we had talked about um, not bringing anything back to our, um, our first meeting in February, but our second meeting in February, um, taking feedback that anyone may have and um, 
best case scenario, we look at implementing some of these rates, um, or we can talk about it further. If there's any other questions we can answer, um, you know, we can do it at that time as well. So, so we're looking at implementing this site almost immediately. So the reason for that is we have our current ARPA projects that we're moving forward with um, that we need to start mm -hmm. setting rates for. Um, and uh, Councilman Smith had mentioned before, uh, I believe one of our previous work sessions, that if we can increase this more gradually, sure. um, that is for the best. So we're, we've been talking about implementing um, quarterly, you know, over the next I don't know, five years or whatever it is. And it's the beginning of the year. I mean, it's uh, beginning of a fiscal year, so that makes sense. I just, I guess I was a little surprised. Well, and, and this goes right along with what we've shown you before of what we were going to have. We've all known we're going to have to do additional rate increase, increases to continue to do the projects that you've already put in applications for. If we don't do those, we cannot close on those loans. We won't have the revenue to do those. So I'm, that part isn't new. What we're trying to do is get really more to a point where we know what we need over the next five years so we can lay out the steps so everybody knows what to anticipate over the next five years. We looked at, I think it was Yankton, they, when they did their, was it their water treatment plant, they went ahead and set the rates for 2022, but at the same time they also showed everybody what to expect over the next five years to get to where they need to be. I can't remember how many increases they were, they had there, but we would like to do something similar to that. And yeah, we'd like to set rates for the next few years. So, Joe, you're coming back up the 21st with uh, just comments from the public, or is that going to be first reading? I think that, you know, depending upon what feedback we receive, um, we could have a draft resolution or a, a resolution of what it would look like. Um, I'm sure there will be comments on that and some discussion, um, which you could act on, or we could table and further discuss. Joe, all these costs costing out of things are based on the Randall. So are we in agreement that the four options, the Randall source is the best option? For a secondary source and moving forward into the future, my opinion is yes. Um, and, if all we are, the, and all, to be clear, all these costs that you worked out are based on the $30 million Randall Project. $60 million. 60, yes, Correct. they do include Randall Water. Yep. Right. You do Missouri River intake, it's going to go up a lot more. And I know they mentioned this in the wastewater rate review when they were talking about it, but I do like that we're building back in our storm sewer. Um, or our ability to fund storm sewer projects. If you remember, we used to charge part of that, and we basically eliminated that when we did Sanborn and some of our other projects. So this will get us to a point in the future where we can start funding some of those capital projects. We do know there's going to need to be improvements made based on the uh, three different regions that are being studied right now. So that gives you some funding to go for those capital projects as well. So there's several people sitting in the audience, and I think we're done with our presentation. Is that concludes? This is his show. Oh, <laughs> so I wonder if if somebody if somebody at wants to come up and, and give more information if they'd like at so, at this point. Uh, I, I recognize some of the representatives, but I just at least we've got time, I guess, if if they want to come up and relay any other facts or information. <laughs> but this and I'd like to reiterate, and I'm sure you guys know this is a lot of information. Um, and like we said, it's it is happening fast because of where we're at. Um, you know, I want to say the I have pulled up on my computer here. The last time we had talked, we had looked at being at $108 um, in the end, but that did not set in these. Um, I will call them not to say we weren't responsible, but fiscally responsible. Um, planning as far as having money for projects every year to continue our 
um, distribution improvements, our wa wastewater collection improvements. Um, so I would say from, from where we were going to where we are going, and I know they, you guys um, even factored in inflation rates to some of our projects moving forward. Um, so from where we were to where we are going, I don't feel as that much different um, for the benefits that we're receiving. Um, I know obviously there will be some people that, that don't agree. Um, and if we do end up going a different direction, that's the way it is. Um, that, that's that's my, my professional opinion. Water will be an issue in the future for this city. I know I keep, Again. <laughs> I keep thinking, you know, in the future, people will thank us. <laughs> but in the present, they may Not so much. have our hides. But, I mean, I think we have to be forward thinking. We have to, um, we can't wait I knew you until it's a crisis. So. Tired of being quiet. The one thing, that, the, one thing the community needs to understand is the fact that the option of not doing anything is not an option. I mean, that's, one, that's the bottom line. And, and they're not going to like to hear that, but the option of doing nothing isn't there on the table. It's one of these processes here, and that's what the community is just going to have to take in and, and make it work. It affects every one of us. It's not like... I'm looking forward to telling my wife, because I know she's not listening now, but when I get home and tell her what's going to go on, she's not going to be any happier with me than anybody else is, but we don't have a choice. I mean, our hands are tied, and if we want to try to keep Mitchell moving forward and to have these other industries possibly come down, we have to do something for the future of this community. So. Correct. That's Mr. correct. Ryder. You're Andy Ryder. Uh, Mitchell Citizen. And great points, uh, a lot of great points. Um, one thing I didn't hear for sure, and it, really touched right again then as Sue brought that up and now Marty Marty finished with that as you talk about looking forward. Um, you said we're at, you said the water level that we're at, you said where we're projected to be at in 2040 at the 5.4 or wherever at a, at a peak. Um, if you do the Randall project, it, it obviously can get to that amount then. Um, can it go higher? It, does that just go to that level, or is there extra that can still be bought once you put the hardware in place and, and then you have it? Because looking forward, yeah, our, is, is that going to be our, our max? And Mitchell has some great growth or some great business come along in the next 10 or 12 years. And we go, oh, that was great planning, but maybe it still wasn't enough. So With the ability to use both BY and Randall, yes. we would vert a little over double our capacity we have right now. No, I, I, saw, three times. I saw those numbers, but <laughs> at our projected use, would so, we have more available? Can we still buy higher yep. than that from the river? The answer to that is yes, and to be determined. Um, you know, there is, in a project like this, the major cost is the installation and not necessarily the size of the pipe. So at that point, like I said, we're, we're very preliminary. These are high-level um, cost estimates, but I feel like they're, they're comfortable cost estimates. Okay, um, then. So, so at the size pipe that you foresee right now, if it's going as at its maximum capacity, is that the numbers it would hit then, the 5.4? Or would, is there room above that? There's room above. Nice. Okay. Those just important things. Don't worry about the last. I didn't hear that answer yet. There's more. Thanks. Yep. In just comparing the BY expansion, the bottleneck project or Randall, we get access to way more ability for future water through Randall than we would with the bottleneck project. Correct. Correct. And we still have the option at some point to move forward with the bottleneck project with BY. Right. Are we going to get this presentation out on our website? Yeah, I can go back and add both of these onto this agenda. So anybody that wants to go view it can go see the City Council work session, and those will be on there. I'll also forward them out to you as council. Give me until tomorrow. <laughs> Anything else? Good news. <laughs> <laughs> Super Bowls in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. We'll be adjourned then. Okay.